Welcome to the Wisconsin Podcast. I'm Greg Sauer. On this podcast, we talk Wisconsin things, everything from media, sports, culture, nature, politics, and more. With Major League Baseball's opening day fast approaching this week, I talk with Caitlin Moyer, the director of new media for the Milwaukee Brewers. Moyer, a native Wisconsinite, started working for the team as an intern in the corporate marketing department in 2003 and worked her way up in the organization. Currently, she focuses on digital new media, including social media and digital advertising. Moyer also teaches classes in the College of Communications at her alma mater, Marquette University. I dropped by Miller Park recently to chat with Moyer about some of the more interesting moments of her career, including the story of Hank the Ballpark Pup, the first time she met Bob Euchre, and the Brewer's recent video paying tribute to the movie The Sandlot. By the time everybody listens to this, they'll probably hear or have seen the uh, Sandlot video. Uh, so bravo on on, on that. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that and how that came together? Sure. Um, thanks, by the way. Um, it- message the success even more than we imagined. Um, while we were always brainstorming ideas for the coming season and you know, looking ahead to 2018, saw that it was a major anniversary for the Sandlot, the 25th anniversary, thought, wouldn't that be fun? It's one of my favorite movies. Um, really resonated with the clubhouse. Once guys got wind of it, it was, you know, can I be part of this type of thing? And you know, their buy-in was really key. They were, you know, high attention to detail, wanting to get it right, sticking around after practice to to film it. The casting turned out to be perfect. You know, like I said, that's a, that's a movie that really resonates with this group more so than you know, like a Field of Dreams or uh, a Major League. So I think that's really what sold it and made it work. Uh, Philip says Smalls, uh, that's kind of perfect, right? It's perfect. You know, when we had the idea, we didn't even have Christian Yelich, but turned out that he's, you know, a ringer for Benny the Jet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was pretty cool. Um, how do you know? How do you work with the players on content like that? How do you like? What kind of relationships do you have to build to, with them and you know, negotiate with them uh, about being in these, you know, various content pieces? I think fortunately for us, we have a, a good track record where we've built trust. They see that a lot of the things that we've done in the past have been really well received, and that you know they're high quality, well produced and and things like that. So I think, um, you know, keep continuing that showing them, you know, when things are getting a lot of press and a lot of buzz, obviously with this one, it's really easy to see, but um, you know, coming up with the ideas and then, you know, it's, you kind of pick your, your guy, you say, okay, I think Phillips would be interested in this. If we get him on board, I think we can, you know, the dominoes will fall into place. So, um, you know, just, just selling it to the guys that way, um, you know, and it's a two-way dialogue. So if they have ideas and they want to do things, you know, making sure that they know that they can approach us and, or give us tips about some stuff that might might be happening um, in the clubhouse that we can cover for social, but it's it's really changed over the last few years from having no guys on social media to one or two on Twitter where everyone else in the clubhouse kind of looked at them like, what are you doing, to um, pretty much everyone in the clubhouse, with the exception of maybe three, four guys are on some form of social media. And how do you interact as, you know, the Brewers brand with the players' individual accounts? How does that kind of work out? Do you just amplify them when it makes sense? Or what's the kind of relationship between those accounts? Yeah, we like to help the players um, expand their reach. Amplify is a great word. Um, We help them. We work with them even at the minor league level to help them get their accounts verified. And um, we're there to help if there's any security issues or they're locked out of their accounts or things like that. Um, And then we're always monitoring them for for good and for for bad. and um, reaching out to them um, and then, you know, retweeting them or, you know, asking them, you know, oh, I saw you're playing. Um, a lot of these guys this off season were playing Fortnite, so video game, and they were streaming it live on Twitch. And I, that's like so far out of my league. Fortunately, we have um, my new media coordinator in our department. He's into gaming. So he kind of explained to me what it was. Said, so what, they're playing video games live with people like right now? <laughs> so we like watched them play and you, know, you can hear them talking and things like that. So then when we got down to spring training, we knew that that was something that they were interested in. And we, had, we posted a picture of them playing it in the clubhouse and talked to the guys a little bit more about that kind of thing. So always kind of monitoring, seeing, you know, what, what they're into and yeah, helping them expand their reach. Sometimes they have charitable efforts. You know, Chase Anderson 
does some stuff with um, strikeouts when he pitches. So we we like to help with them with those efforts too. Do you run uh, like workshops with the players about, you know, what to do, what not to do, especially when they're in the minor leagues? Yes. Um, we have a training session every spring training um, in the major league side and in the minor league side. And um, it's just filled with do's and don'ts. Um, we don't like to scare them off, but we do like to show them examples of things that they may not have thought about um, that could that could come back to to haunt them. Um, but a lot of it too is is showing them, you know, things that work. A lot of times, guys, say, I don't know what to post. Like my life is boring. It's like, well, to the average fan, it's not. You think you you know your life consists of working out and playing baseball every day. Well, fans don't get to see you in the gym, so. Hosting that gym selfie, you know, will be well received. Um, congratulating your teammates on success, and you know, interacting with them, poking fun at them. Um, those are the types of things that that people enjoy. So, just kind of coaching them on those types of things as well. Stepping back a little bit, uh, how are you feeling about the upcoming season? Uh, what's kind of the mood at Maryvale and at Miller Park these days? What's uh, kind of the buzz around here? Um, it's it's really exciting. It's a really fun group of guys uh, to be around. The chemistry is definitely there. Um, those intangibles, I think, to, to get off to such a great start in Cactus League play, um, I think it has everyone you know just really, really excited. Just to set the table a little bit, can you tell me a little bit about what your day to day is, what your job is during the season? What what are you up to? What what is your kind of purview? Sure. Um, what the thing I think I love most about my job is that no two days are exactly the same, so it keeps um, me busy and creative and on my toes. Um, on a game day. Usually our office opens at nine o'clock, so we'll come in at nine. Um, we'll might have meetings with other departments and things like that. And then around three o'clock or whenever batting practice comes along, we'll go down to the field and we'll hang out at batting practice. And sometimes we have an agenda down there. Maybe we need to get a guy to pose with the bobblehead or um, get a guy to record a video or something like that. But other times we're just kind of sitting there waiting to catch lightning in the bottle. Someone's, you know, dancing during VP or um, what have you. Um, so we're hanging around for that. And then all the way right up to pregame with first pitch or national anthem, um, if there's anything cool going on in pregame, we're capturing that. And then during the game itself, we're covering that um, kind of live and ongoing on all of our platforms. That's a that's a, a regular in-season thing where we're kind of in the groove. Um, the off-season, obviously, obviously, it's a little bit different. Um, and uh, the off-season is you know, actually a little bit more challenging at times because you lose your best assets. The players are gone. So um, it's more nine to five, less weekends and holidays and, and what have you. But it's it's trying to be more creative and, and finding that balance because, you know, you're out of season. So you don't need to be in the fans face every day, but you want to be that constant reminder of, of Brewers baseball. So luckily, you know, the players, we can reach out to them and get their participation in other ways. Then we've got our fan fest and we've got spring training. So um, it goes by a lot faster than than I think fans think, but uh, for, for us anyway. Um, but yeah, it's in season and out of season, it kind of changes up a lot. So uh, talk about a little bit the role, the role of like kind of serendipity in your job. Uh, you're kind of just waiting for, you know, cool things to happen to a certain degree. But I'm, I'm sure there's also a lot of planning, especially this time of year. So what is the, kind of the balance between the, you know, those like candid moments that just happen and the things that you're planning? Um, I think you so we like to be prepared for as much as we can. Um, so we have a content calendar and we fill it up with things that we know are going to happen regardless. So, you know, major holidays. Um, and so maybe there's content we can plan around, you know, um, and then, you know, player birthdays. So we're going to always wish our players and our coaches a happy birthday on our platforms. And then you have your ticket packages and when those go on sale and our marketing messages and our community appearances. So anything that we can possibly put on this calendar that we know we want to cover and then um, be as prepared for those things as we can. And then we are freeing ourselves up to be able to um, be creative and jump onto things like trending topics or just finding things that that are just happening naturally. And then you kind of get to know the guy's uh, personalities from being around them so much. So you, you know, oh, wow, this is a good song with a good beat. Someone's going to break out into a dance. <laughs> uh, and so then you just have your camera ready to go. And that's how we capture a lot of our good gifts, too. We just know that if we train the camera on them, a lot of them are hams and they're going to make a funny <laughs> face or do something hilarious. And then we're going to be able to capture that. 
Uh, who's the funniest guy in the locker room right now? Oh, boy. Um, there's a lot of guys that are funny for different reasons. Um, Jet Bandy, he does a lot of imp- impersonations. We hope to do some stuff with him later. Um, Stephen Vogt, I don't know if you saw his referee stuff. Obviously, him starring as Ham Porter. Um, he's got a great acting career, uh, <laughs> you know, down the road here. Um, but uh, Orlando Arcia, he doesn't talk a lot, uh, but he loves the camera and he makes funny faces and he likes to have fun with his teammates. So catching him in the dugout uh, before the game, you're always going to get something funny. Um, between him and Jesus Aguilar, they're just a tag team that uh, just will always make you laugh. Keon Broxton, he's always got a smile on his face. He's always um, someone that's going to be interacting with the fans, and he's always going to be dancing around. So, um, But I think everybody on this team is kind of a character in his own right. Uh, one of the interesting things about the, the team right now is there's a lot of um, – uh, Spanish players and American players, and and you've mentioned the uh, camaraderie that the team has. Um, how do you work, you know, with the, the Spanish audience as well? How do you market to them uh, with those players? That's a great question. Um, we actually have a Spanish translator who works for the team, and he um, manages our Brewers Spanish Twitter account and our Facebook page. So we work really closely with him for content and folks at MLB that will help us with translations. But um, we do have dedicated dedicated accounts. And then we help um, the guys, again, like we would with anyone, with their accounts as well. So I think it definitely expands our reach. And we saw a lot of that, too, with the World Baseball Classic and the guys participating in that last year. But I know that it's been a big priority for us and that our marketing team is working with an Hispanic marketing agency and things like that. So our efforts are really ramping up. And um, we have events like Serviceros Day and things like that. So it has been a really important part of, of who we are as the Brewers and especially with the amount of Latin players that are on our team. I think it's very important. Um, so I think that the community has been appreciative and um, the outreach has, you know, it's, it's made inroads. Talk to me a little bit about the channels that you use. So there's there's so many. There's like a new one every week or yeah. every month or year, <laughs> you know, and they come they come and go. So how do you choose what channels to be on? Uh, well, um, we have been on everything that there possibly can be. I'm pretty sure. Um, Every time I read about a new app, I will sign up for it personally. And I will, usually within a day or two, I can figure out if this has applications for us, if it has staying power, does it have something else that the other apps don't already have or can't easily be copied. Um, so like Vero, I think it was the most recent thing that was a buzz and I was kind of out of touch a little bit with spring training. Everything's really hectic down there. Saw this app. I was a little late to the party, and like by the time I had downloaded it, there was already backlash about it. So uh, on to the next thing, yeah. like everyone else. But um, I think the big four that we really focus our efforts on, and we have to with such a small department, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. Um, we are we have a Tumblr account that we don't use as much. I don't even know if Google Plus is a thing, but we were on that for a while. We have Pinterest, um, we and we still use it, um, but that's just more of a niche audience there. And um, but the the big four is what we try to focus on and to um, differentiate our content across those um, and cater to the different audiences. So we might have one really great piece of content like the Sandlot video, but the way that we deliver it on those platforms might be slightly different. How quickly did Snapchat like become important in what you what you did as a brand? Um, it took a little while. It took a little while. Um, I, first, even I didn't really see value for a business in having a Snapchat account, but um, I quickly got. I quickly fell in love with how fun and engaging it is. And um, a a lot of our players, I think, gravitate toward that, you know, short snippets of video. It's not overly produced. It's, you know, was less than 10 seconds. So they know that we're not going to steal too much of their time, Um, you know, drawing on the screens. you know, all the use of emojis and all the bitmojis and stuff like that. So I think it, it reaches a, a different consumer segment, you know, the younger audience that I think is so important to baseball that we're trying to reach. Now, that being said, with some of their redesigns and things like that, um, there are some questions about the reach and the fact that Instagram created Instagram stories. So I'm not sure where Snapchat's going, but as a platform, I, I still do like it and I still do think it has, has has value. It just was maybe a little bit slower to jump onto that than some of the other ones. 
So where do you see your efforts going on social media? Do you, do you feel like there are going to be more that you're going to be jumping on now? Or are you kind of like, this is the plan for the year? I, I mean, it's hard. It's it's really hard to to figure out or predict what's going to happen next. Um, you know, live video became a thing and um, that wasn't something that was in our plans. And, you know, with, uh, you know, rights holders and things like that, it, it you know, there's also challenges um, and things that people have to adapt all of a sudden and figure out how are we going to handle this. Um, and, and, you know, being live actually kind of scares me it's, it's to some degree as well. So um, you, you just never know and you kind of have to to go with the flow and, and adapt on the fly. So I, I have no idea what's coming next. Um, I can't predict, you know, what, you know, what exactly is like missing from the repertoire, what um, it's going to have to be something really big to come in and compete with those established entities. Uh, you, you mentioned video I and mean, Facebook Live and, and, you know, Periscope and things like that uh, becoming more and more important. How are you going to use that kind of medium uh, in the next year? Um, the live, it's, it's tricky. Like I said, it, it scares me a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, even live streaming, batting practice, you don't want to, you know, pick up people's conversations or any words they might, maybe shouldn't be saying and things like that. So and if you stand too far away, then you lose, you know, the cool factor. Um, also if you do it too often, I think, um, that will lose some of the appeal as well. So picking our spots to mix it in. Facebook Live, we live streamed when we announced that Chase Anderson was starting opening day. Um, so we're just going to have to pick our spots, I think. Um, there, it, there's just going to be very select things that will lend themselves to being completely live streamed on our, our uh, social platforms. So going back, what is kind of the goal of all of these things, all of these channels, all of this this work that you're, all these pieces of content you're putting out there? What's kind of the goal for you and in and, and your job? Um, I just want to connect the fans to our brand and to our players and, um, you know, reach the fans where they already are. They're already on Facebook. They're already on Twitter. They're already on Snapchat and they're already on Instagram. So we can pop up in their feed and provide them a little like behind the scenes glimpse and um, just get build that fan affinity for us. And, um, you know, it's not a heavy sell. Yes, we're going to put ticket sales messages and theme nights and things like that. But that's really um, not the primary goal in my mind. It's just to build that relationship with the fans and um, to keep them wanting more, more content from us. And to then eventually, you know, make sure that they come out to the park and see it for themselves in person. Uh, I'm assuming there's a lot of departments here that uh, are looking to get you to do various things. So how do you weigh whether this should be a message that should go out on social media or not? Uh, I, I know everybody wants their thing to be is the most important thing to them, but it might not be the best thing for your brand voice. So how do you weigh that and work internally? Absolutely. That's where our content calendar comes in. So I try to get ahead of time, you know, everything that we possibly have going on. Um, not everything is going to go on social media, but challenge them to ask themselves, would you share this piece of content or, you know, so if you, this showed up in your newsfeed, would you retweet it or would you share it? And if the answer is no, then we need to go back and to make it more engaging. I realize like not everything is obviously going to be like that, but um, if we can keep that in the back of our minds when we're forming our content, I think we're in a better place. I want to go back to the the Sandlot video a little bit because uh, in talking about one of the stars of it at the end, when the cameo from Hank, which was, you know, maybe I'm spoiling the video for people, but uh, Hank is in the video. Hank the ballpark uh, pup is in the in the video. I kind of want to ask you a little bit about Hank. That's one of the, one of those moments of serendipity that just happened. Can you take me back to that that season at spring training and how when did you know like this was going to be like a thing? So, you know, when you asked me earlier about the serendipity and being prepared. So I was 2014 was actually my first season in this role. I've been with the club for a really long time, started in 2003 as an intern, worked my way up so I went into the 2014 season with all these goals and things that I wanted to accomplish. It all went out the window when I got the call. Hey, there's this dog that's wandered onto the field and the players have really taken to him. Can we put him out there and see if we can find its owner? Sweetest dog ever. Um, it's just so docile and just like let you dress him up like a, a baby. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, who could have abandoned this dog? And so that was our first um, priority was, you know, can we help find this dog's owner? But it was, uh, again, serendipity, a per perfect storm, and 
Hank just being the, the type of dog with that personality that he has, like we just started fun stuff with him. What if we put this dog in the sausage race? Well, that blew up. You know, we put a GoPro on him and did Hank cam and that was fun. And I just couldn't believe that no one came forward and even just tried to, to say that, that's my dog. Um, so, at, you know, flash forward, we end up like, okay, we've, we've got to adopt him and bring him back to Milwaukee. But, you know, that I don't like to use the term viral very loose, but um, that was my first experience with something that was truly viral. I mean, the dog got a full page in People Magazine. So it's a dog in People Magazine <laughs> and to the World Dog Awards. And um, I went to L.A. with them, and it was like kind of a surreal moment when I'm taking a picture of a dog getting a award on stage from Paris Hilton and Terrell Owens. <laughs> I guess, you know, when I started my career in baseball, never did I think I would be in this spot right now. But, again, that's what I really love about this job is the opportunity to, you know, one day you could be with Paris Hilton and Terrell Owens, and the next day you could be reenacting something from the Sandlot. And some days you're just covering a baseball game. <laughs> but, yeah, Hank um, – cameo in uh, the Sandlot. He's he's kind of, uh, you know, taking a uh, lower key presence in the last few years. You know, he's getting older and whatnot, and um, he's comfortable at home. And, you know, when this idea came about, it was like, he's got to be the beast. And it's natural. He has to, right? You know, one of the interesting things about about Hank and that that whole thing is it kind of mirrors in some sense, like the origin story of like Bernie Brewer in some sense, in the sense that it was kind of like a fan thing that it, like the fans kind of created it. They made it happen. They created that icon for themselves. So how do you as like a brand kind of go along for the ride when when the fans kind of create something like this? Yeah, you definitely have to you know have your finger on the pulse of you know what are people talking about? What are they glomming on to? Uh, Travis Shaw's nickname, Mayor of Ding Dong City. Now, our Brewers fans didn't come up with that. That was a writer in Boston, but it carried over with him. And, you know, helping to um, stir the pot a little bit and uh, further it along, I think, is our role in that and showing that we are listening to the fans uh, and just being careful not to take it too far because it is something that, you know, they're steering the bus on. But um, definitely trying to be in the know and and be aware of those types of things as they're happening. Speaking of Travis Shaw, I mean, the the bobblehead, uh, I mean, that's amazing. I mean, where did that idea come from for that bobblehead? Obviously, he had a breakout year with us and uh, with his nickname, I think uh, kind of a natural thing. Our marketing department does a fantastic job. Of, um, our bobbleheads, they keep topping themselves every year with not only the bobbleheads, but there's the giveaways in general. Yeah, it's Travis Shaw behind a podium giving a speech and uh, a little Easter egg. If you actually have like a magnifying glass, you can read like words on his speech oh. on the podium. So well, what does it say? Cool. What a, oh, you'll have you have to, to wait look. to get it. You'll have to wait to get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. How did this become your life? I mean, you've been with the Brewers for over a decade now, um, started as an intern. Uh, how did like this become your, your life, your day-to-day uh, job? Uh, well, started as an intern, and um, I knew I wanted to work in baseball. Um, originally, I wanted to be a journalist and cover the team. I never wanted to be on air. I wanted to be a writer. And I, I think at the time in college, I had this perception, like, I don't want to have a deadline every day. And someone talked me into PR and marketing, and I went down that path. And at the time, I look back, and I'm like, my thinking was, you know, kind of messed up because any career you go into, you have multiple deadlines every day, and especially when I ended up in marketing when you've got to traffic ads here and there and whatnot. But um, it, you know, at this time, journalism was kind of in flux and social media was just on the rise. Uh, as I was graduating, Facebook was just becoming something for college kids. So um, got my foot in the door with the Brewers, never really took it out. out. Um, this is around the same time as the ownership change, built a marketing department, um, got Got in there with um, Kathy Schwab, who's the Senior Director of Marketing. Um, I was her assistant for the first year in a seasonal role, so that meant that they didn't know if they'd need me after the season, but I just tried to make myself indispensable and thought, you know what, if I just don't screw it up, um, I should be able to parlay into a full-time job because there's no way one woman can run the marketing department. And fast forward all these years, and now we have an in-house productions team, which has you know three videographers and a copywriter, and we've got theme nights and graphic designers, and um, you know we've branched off as a new media department. But um, it's been a really fun and exciting journey to have been there from the beginning when it was just two of us in the marketing department, and I've had several roles. And as social media, you know, Facebook became a thing, and we absorbed those into the marketing 
marketing department and then made the case, you know, if we want to do this well, we really need to have someone dedicated to it. And now we're building our own department, which is really exciting. How long did it take uh, executives to take social media seriously within the brewers? I mean, you see this across industries. Like, I think a lot of people doing it were taking it seriously, but there was like, uh, what's the business case of this? At what point did it become like, this is a main channel, this is very important for the brewer? Obviously, I was an advocate from the (laughs) get-go, and um, I remember, you know, showing some people what Facebook was and trying to say, you know, don't be afraid of it. It has good potential. But um, I think people understood, but I don't think – I think it's really hard to quantify and to – dedicate, you know, a full-time resource just to that was a little bit scary. For me, it was 2012 when um, I think we got Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, and something else, like all in one. And it um, it was just kind of going faster than we could keep up with. So I think that that um, really set the stage for then in 2013, uh, at the end of that year, to um, kind of go into this role and to form this department. But yeah, it just, it was, it was kind of a slow journey. And at first it was okay to keep up with, but then as these platforms uh, multiplied and as the functions of each one multiplied, where you just had to, if you wanted to keep up, you know, you had to have video and you had to have pictures and gifts and so on and so forth. um, It, you know, just became a necessity. (laughs) As far as like staffing now, I mean, how do you staff it? I mean, how has the staffing changed? Well, it's actually, it's it's double. So it's myself and my coordinator. (laughs) (laughs) So it's really just two of us. Um, It's a lot of channels for two people. It is. And we have... um, some interns that will come in and out during the season. Um, We have some resources through MLB Advanced Media. They're very helpful. And then we have a lot of people within the organization that work to help get us content. So our in-house production team, they're the ones that helped us with the Sandlot video and put that piece together. They'll provide lots of content for us um, during the season, whether it's something, an idea that originates with us or something that they're pushing from a marketing standpoint. We've got our team photographer um, we've got um, our Brewers on Tap folks that will will do some stories and some features for us. So we have um, a lot of people that are are helping us. But um, when it comes down to it, the two full time people, it's us, and we split it up. Um, we our goal this year is to cover every game from the start of spring training to the end of the season. And so one of us will be on every single road trip. Where in the past we've gone on a few. I did most of it myself last year, which was just a lot. I, Still um, in shock of how the players can do it and actually, you know, perform physically. Um, but now that um, my coordinator can travel too, we're going to split it up and and hopefully the content will be um, consistent. Uh, so how do you make it through an entire season? Uh, <laughs> you do on the, all those road trips and things like that. Uh, what? How do you find to uh, keep the the steam going? <laughs> um, you know, it's a lot easier when when the team is is fun to be around and they're winning. I think you know, obviously that that that's not something we have any control over. So, but last season, just you know, we, we um, exceeded expectations, and and everywhere I would go, I had another counterpart text me this morning. I won't say what from what team, but he said, "Can we borrow some of your clubhouse culture?" <laughs> um, so again, those intangibles is what I'm I'm really excited about. Um, obviously, you're not fortunate to have that every season, and and you can't. But um, that kind of those little um, victories and those milestones that that's kind of what gets you through it. Um, um, even, you know, in tough times when you see a guy making his rookie debut and things like that, you, a, a thing that we try to do is, you know, with tell each game's individual story. What makes this game different than, you know, game 42 and game 91? Um, is there a certain first pitch? Is it a certain theme night? Is it so-and-so's debut? Is it someone on a streak? What's happening right now? Um, and, uh, you know, if we just focus it one game at a time, um, that's how we get through. Do the players, the culture of the locker room rub off on the rest of the, like the front office? Does it rub off on like what's going on in like the culture of your department? You know what I'm saying? Does it emanate from that or does it maybe go back the other way? How does the the culture of the entire organization, how is it affected by the players? I think, you know, just see, you know, even if there's people within the organization that don't have the daily interaction, I think just seeing it even on TV, you know, last year, the home run celebration, that gauntlet, I think that that um, kind of energy just, you know, will just um, kind of carry itself throughout the organization. Um, We're having a gauntlet bobblehead this year, um, for instance. I think, you know, people just get really excited about the 
the little victories and the small things along the way. When Eric Thames went crazy last April, you could just feel it in the office every game. You're wondering, you know, what's he going to do tonight? So I think you know, everyone here works so hard and such long hours that they pay really close attention to what's happening. And, and you know, you feel like you're part of that team, too. So you you grew up a Brewers fan. You're, you're from Wisconsin. You're a Wisconsinite. Uh, you work for the hometown team. Uh, what, what's that like for you? Um, it's awesome. Originally when I was looking for a job, I was willing to move anywhere and do anything. Um, I've actually interviewed all over the place, uh, in baseball to start off. And I was just really fortunate to get my foot in the door here with the Brewers. And, um, and so a lot of people, that's what they need to do to take the next step and to advance. And, um, you know, originally I thought that that might be me, but after being here for so long and I can't imagine taking, doing, especially doing this role for another organization, I think it would be really hard. A lot of what I can um, do so quickly on social uh, is because I've been around the organization for so long and grew up a fan. Uh, one example would be when we had our Wall of Honor event and I saw Richie Sexton and Jeff Jenkins having a drink at the bar and I snapped a picture, tweeted out something like, um, you know, remember that time we went back to back? Which time? And that's how we <laughs> imagine this conversation went. Yeah. And I didn't have to look up any stats. I just remembered as a kid that happened more than once. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, if I were to go, you know, okay, the Cardinals are going to pay me massive amounts of more money and I'm going to get a raise um, and a title change there. Um, I'm going to go to the Cardinals. I think it would be a huge learning curve, you know, to learn history and even just the way their fans, the voice of their organization. Um, and that's the thing with social media. When you're a voice like that, um, people will call you out really quickly if you make a mistake. So it's a huge boost uh, in, in the sense you can be authentic. Uh, without trying too hard. So it's, it's a very helpful thing to be, in this case, to be a fan. Uh, yes, yes. Um, you know, there are times when it's, it's uh, you know, and after obviously being, working here so long, it's, you, you're you still a fan, but you have to remove yourself to yeah. some level. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it helps to to know the voice of, of the fan base really well so that you can mimic it yourself and, and being a fan first. Uh, I would I would imagine if I worked here, I would be professional about it, right? But uh, the, in my mind, there would be all, be all these moments where you're just like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> you know, you'd have some, like, fanboy or fangirl moments uh, during the course of your day. Do you ever have any of those around here? You know what? I can't say that I I have here. I mean, it's really – there's a lot of things that I've gotten to experience and do that are, are really cool. And I know that, you know, other people would, would love to experience as well. I mean, meeting Hank Aaron, that's awesome and amazing. Um, but you know, you, you do remove yourself and you're not like a fan of a certain player. Um, you know, the way that they, you know, a normal person would be, yeah. you don't watch a baseball game the same way. Even if I was to go watch a random game between two teams, I wasn't attached to, I'd be looking at totally different things than the average person. I'd be like, Oh, look, they're promoting their Twitter handle on the scoreboard. <laughs> uh, or they've got their players, Twitter yeah. handles, you know, that's the kind of stuff I see now. Um, or I'm like, Oh, that's a really cute cute picture of a kid. I'm going to take a picture of this kid and send it to my counterpart that's working. Maybe they'll use it on their Instagram. Like those are, that's how I, I view um, sports now, um, which is, which is interesting. But um, I think last year I was in Atlanta and it was their nineties night. And Mark Paul Gossler was there. <laughs> that's I fangirled a little bit. I, I got to meet him and I fangirled a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, one, I think one of the things that, uh, um, you know, I you, you grew up watching the game or what listening to the Brewers. You grew up, I'm assuming, with the voice of of, of Euchre in your mind in the summer. Uh, I assume you've gotten to run across him here at the at Miller Park. Uh, do you remember the first time you met uh, Bob Euchre? I do, and it's kind of a funny story. He probably would never remember this, but I was an intern, and in our press box, um, there's ice cream, like uh, soft serve ice cream, and so I was in line to get ice cream, and Bob Euchre's in front of me, and I'm just like, I'm not going to say anything because I'm you know, just an intern, but that's that's cool. There's Bob Euchre, and he gets ice cream, and he's like moving along, putting his toppings on, and I go and there's no more ice cream. I'm like, oh my gosh, Bob, you could just hit the rest of the ice cream. So I'm like, okay. So I like jiggle the handle a little bit more and I'm like, all right, I guess I'm not having ice cream tonight. And I like start to walk away. He's like, 
hey, what's wrong? And I was like, oh, there's no more ice cream. And he actually went to the back and like told the lady that was working that we were out of ice cream and helped me get ice cream. So um, it was a really positive, good experience. <laughs> but no, Bob is a treasure. Um, he's awesome um, to work with. He's not a fan of social media, but um, he's always, you know, down in the dugout before the games telling stories and you just want to soak in every minute of that. It's He's, he's a treasure. Do you feel lucky? I feel like the Brewers franchise has a lot of these icons. These uh, you have the sausages. I mean, you have Hank. You have you know Bernie Brewer. You have Euchre. Uh, there's just so many of these little things about this team. Do you feel lucky? I don't know that all the teams in the league have those things. Do you feel privileged that uh, the team that you work for has all of these uh, various things? I do. I do. I think it's, it allows us to have a lot of uh, different options when it comes to, to content that we can put out there and produce and, um, you know, new stories to pass down to future generations um, and new fans that are, you know, just coming to become Bruce fans for whatever re- connection or whatever reason. And um, it's one of the funniest things is always when um, someone realizes that the M, the ball in the glove logo is an M and a B, it's like <laughs> yeah. mind blowing. It is mind blowing. Um, so that, that's that's always fun for me. Um, but yeah, no, it's, 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 we do have a lot of unique traditions. I think, you know, tailgating is something that sometimes people take for granted. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of other, especially baseball teams where you can do what you can do at Miller park. And, um, I think, I think our fan base is really lucky. As far as your, the people that are your counterparts in like other organizations, when they come to town, uh, you, I'm sure you interact with them to some degree. Uh, what do they make of of this franchise and this ballpark and this uh, team culture? Yeah, our counterparts. Um, so I like to say that on the field we compete and off the field we're friends. Um, so we have annual meetings every year where we all get together and we have you know an email group that we go back and forth with and we're all texting and things like that. So we're very open and idea sharing because something that worked in one market could translate to another. Um, and just to get, you know, there's only... 29 other give or take people that do exactly what we do and face the same challenges. Um, so it's, it's comforting. And sometimes we work together on different efforts. Um, you know, I got a lot of text messages when the Sandlot video went and it was, you know, they're all congratulatory, like, that's awesome. Way to go. Amazing. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's a really nice to have that support system and, you know, same thing will, I would say to them in the same um, situation. So, uh, I think that I, I mentioned one of one of the teams was like, wow, this is one of the f- more fun teams that comes through here. Um, so I hope that that um, carries over through the season and just continues to grow. What's what's the most exciting part about your job? Exciting part about my job. I think it's all exciting. Um, I and I, I really do think it's it's that no two days are alike. And sometimes when you wake up, you never know. You might not know where the day is going to end up taking you. In my career, we've made the postseason twice, and I'm hoping for many more times. Um, Those were some of the most exciting exciting times. Um, And both times were really – 2008 was pre-social media for us completely, and 2011 was just a totally different landscape. So I'm excited for uh, postseason in the era of social media. Um, We've started preparing in recent years as we've kind of knocked on the door – um, you know, ready with some protective eyewear and some some stuff <laughs> for our cameras and our phones for locker room celebrations and stuff like that. But um, I think that's what we all work for, right? Um, I'm hoping that that's in our not too distant future. Regardless of the channel that you're using, what kind of pieces of content work the best? Obviously, a video like the Sandlot thing that that took off. But is there a common thread amongst the things that work or don't work? Um, yes. Uh, people, you know, at the end of the day, we are a baseball team. So obviously highlights work really well. People still love to see home runs. But they also like to see, you know, really good defensive plays to an awesome catch, uh, really cool, like a triple play that we had. Highlights, you know, pick and choose. But then um, anything that showcases the players' personalities um, off the field, I think, as much as we can do of that, you know, I want to say, for lack of a better term, like humanize the players. Um, Mother's Day content, showing the players 
posing with their mothers or, you know, their wives and their children or Father's Day with their dads or their kids, um, you know, then people see that and they say, wow, you know, I'm a mother too or, you know, oh, he has kids just like I do. And um, it kind of forges that connection. Um, with this young team, you, you see a lot of milestones, guys having their first kids, guys getting married and engaged and show, being able to you know, take fans along for that journey. If we can do it in a way that works with them, I think that those are the type of people gravitate toward um, humorous posts, always work. Um, I don't know if you remember, we had Mom Joke Mondays a couple years ago. We had Will Smith on the team, and his mom would text him jokes <laughs> and uh, and you just remember he came, that's one of those serendipity things. Uh, he came out of the dugout one day, Hey, Caitlin, and said some joke. And I, well, no, I don't know what, told me the answer. I laughed. He was, I was like, where did you get that? He said, Oh, my mom texted it to me. <laughs> I said, you know, we should do something with that. And, um, didn't have any idea of Brett Phillips at the time or his laugh. And that was another <laughs> thing that, re- that really took off. But, um, yeah, just, you know, people can relate. Hey, my my mom tells bad jokes too, or she she texts me too. Um, I think those are the types of things that that people are looking for. They wanna they wanna share something that makes them um, that evokes emotion. That really speaks to the idea that you have to have a a strong or a, a trusting relationship with the players. So how do you 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 know build those bonds? I mean, because people come and go in this business, you know, on the on the field. So how do you? develop the relationships with the players and and you know allow them to trust you to participate in kind of their you know, showing off their life a little bit how, how do you do Some that are, i definitely more reserved than others um but i think you know i always try to tell them we're here to help you look good like we're not an investigative reporter who's will you know looking to snap that photo at the wrong time and portray you you know poorly like I'm going to tell them, you know, oh, let's take that picture again. Your eyes were closed. You know, I'm never going to try to get you. I'm trying and we're here to try to help you. So I think it helps that even though the play, the rosters change, that, you know, they're all, it's not always completely changed. So there are some guys that are, you know, more veterans that that, that the, those guys are cool with so-and-so, and we kind of get grandfathered in, and then yeah. we, we build the trust slowly there. Um, so, like, for Christian Yelich, I think he's, like, no idea when he kind of got roped into doing the Sandlot video, like, what are we doing? And um, after we are done, he's like, wow, that was, that was actually good. And I was like, what do you mean actually? <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course it was good. You didn't trust us. Um, so, you know, that obviously now we've built a relationship and a rapport with Christian. So hopefully he'll do more stuff with us. So it's just kind of a, a building a process. But the engagement on the social platforms will oftentimes speak for itself. They see that we're doing fun things. And, you know, sometimes guys will ask us if they can participate, which is the best case scenario. <laughs> So anybody that's been on social media these days, it's 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 kind of a slog for a lot of a lot of people. Uh, obviously, you get to post a lot of fun things, a lot of you know things that people are gonna you know, like or hard uh, on social media. So that's gotta feel good. But there's also this negative negativity around social media today, and I'm just kind of wondering what your opinion. Like, how do you deal with the the negativity? How do you you know as a brand and uh, just kind of deal with that? You know, um, I think that. Um, it builds character. <laughs> uh, it's it's tough, you know. You know, we haven't um, even in the last few years since social media has become a thing. We haven't had every season hasn't been the best season, and we've definitely you know every team goes through ebbs and flows. So um, it's really tough when it's your job to read the comments to not internalize those things. Yeah. It's not like you're terrible. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm terrible. What did I do? Um, so it's it's tough to, to to kind of remove yourself. But you know, there's always always going to be trolls, even when we're performing. Um, you know, really really well. There's always going to be other teams' fans who just want to bring you down, and um, it, it's just, you just have to kind of ignore it. I mean, it's it's not worth getting into it with them on on social media. It's, it's you just kind of gloss over it, and it is what it is. And hate is gonna hate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of one person, just in general, last year, Kato Kalen. I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything about that that Twitter account, but uh, uh, he was obviously a Wisconsin fan, a, Brewer, a, a very strong Brewers fan. Uh, <laughs> has kind of an unvarnished way of commenting on the team. Any kind of reaction from watching that account? He's uh, very passionate. <laughs> it's, it's clear of all his Wisconsin sports teams, and obviously he cares a lot and or he wouldn't be 
taking the time to, to comment on the way he does. So hopefully we make Cato happy this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you brought up a little bit earlier, uh, you, you get some help from the league, from MLB. Uh, I'm kind of curious about how your relationship works with them. Sure. Um, so MLB um, Advanced Media or MLBAM, they're the technology arm of Major League Baseball and they provide a lot of resources for the team. So um, if we have a great highlight, I can just ask them for a clip of the highlight and it will get up on our website and then I'll have a native video for social or they'll cut me a GIF. So I don't have to do the technical component, which is awesome. You know, along with that comes things like sponsorship. The sponsorship teams work together and then I get handed like a sponsorship required post or things like that. Um, what's been nice is I've been kind of brought to the table in a lot of these discussions to help brainstorm like how can we make make these things more engaging and whatnot. Um, and then MLB has, you know, a lot of their own initiatives that they ask us to help with, and, and we do. Um, and then um, they're always looking for good content. So when we have something cool, like the Sandlot video, for example, they were like one of the first accounts to retweet it. Um, so it's, it's a good relationship. Since you teach a class at Marquette um, to young people who are looking to maybe do something like you, you're doing in your, your, your life, did you have any advice for for your students? Um, yeah, I think it, what I found, so I used to teach a media writing class. So it was just how to write, you know, kind of AP style, if you will, and then copywriting. So writing for journalism, PR, and advertising. And then this new media class opportunity opened up, and I jumped at the chance. But I've struggled with this my second semester um, because it's changing so rapidly. So during my first semester, Twitter expanded their character account, you know, doubled it. Um, is just a, one example of something that's changed. I we don't have a textbook because by the time something's printed, everything's irrelevant. So I've asked my students to read books, like real world books, and then each one will read something different and then report back to the class what they learned. And even in some of these books that were published like two years ago, again they're outdated. Um, so you can't you can't even build like a test if I would have said how many characters in a tweet like tests would have been wrong um so I'm just trying to find you know we spend a lot of time in class going over current events and how organizations are using social and good and bad and I think that um you know I, I just encourage people to keep up with the accounts that they think they're doing well and learn from brands that make mistakes um, and to be active um, on the platforms themselves in a good way and really work on that um, personal branding aspect because if you're going to apply for a job you better believe or look at your accounts and how are you portraying yourself. Trying to get a feel for what their mindset is. Um, you know, obviously we can teach you things and teach you our voice and our way, but, you know, what is your inclination and in how you're going to handle something? So um, I, I would encourage, you know, students to keep learning and to keep up with these trends. Um, that's really all you can do. <laughs> It's, it sounds like a lot of what you do in your, your job and, and how you're trying to teach this is just, it's like a mindset. It's just a, like a roll with it kind of thing. Uh, do, you, do you just have any general like mantra or philosophy on like how you approach the changing landscape of what you do? Um, I subscribe to a lot of e-newsletters and have a ton of um, websites bookmarked. So the first thing I do in the morning is I'll have a cup of coffee. I'll go through my emails and then I will scan all those newsletters. And it's like when you open my um, Explorer, I, I literally have like 19 tabs that open up to the platforms and then some other sites and just scanning. I don't obviously have time to read everything, but then I like bookmark um, articles I want to come back to or something that's interesting and um, got to keep on top of those those things. So that's kind of kind of sets the tone for, for how I go about my day. Is there one thing that you're most excited about this season? Is there something on the on the calendar that you're like, yes, let's get to this point, let's get to June, or let's get to July, or, or are you just you're just waiting for the World Series at this point? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm excited for Opening Day because I mean that's just it's a it should be a holiday here yeah, in Wisconsin. Right. It is for Brewers fans, that for, that's for sure. And yes, we open on the road. Um, opening Day to me is at Miller Park and you're here in this building right now and it's just empty and it's it's still a cool ballpark but when you have 40,000 fans filling it up with their energy um you know we we miss we miss having the fans in this place so i'm really looking forward to opening day
Thanks to Caitlin for hosting me at Miller Park and telling me some stories about her job with the Brewers. Make sure to subscribe to the Wisconsin Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. You can stay in the loop about the pod by visiting wispod.com and following the show on Twitter at wispodcast and on Facebook at the Wisconsin Podcast. Cheers. Cheers.